everyone and welcome back to The Journey. As you can see, today we're going to be talking about pediatrics, in particular pyloric stenosis. So to begin with, with pyloric stenosis is a hypertrophy of the circular muscles of the pylorus, um, which pretty much causes a narrowing of the pyloric canal between the stomach and the, the duum. Okay, so I know what I just said is pretty much a mouthful, and for those of you guys who are your visual learners, okay, I did a diagram here to represent what, is, what exactly is going on, okay? So this right here we have is the stomach, okay? This is the duodenum, and the duodenum is just the first part of the small intestines, okay? And then the pylorus muscle is around this region here, okay? So I know this is not a 3D model, but it's pretty much circular, like so. So uh, think of it in that aspect, okay? So if I have narrowing of my pyloric muscle, okay, so what you're going to see is this, okay? So all of a sudden, that circular muscle, it has been narrowed, okay? And stenosis means, you know, a, a, like a narrowing of, okay? So anytime you ever see anything with a stenosis, just know that it's a narrowing of something, all right? So I have a narrowing in this region right here. So, of course, when I'm eating or when the child is eating, right, the normal flow is after the stomach, the food is going to be digested, it's going to be broken down, it's going to um, then enter the jejunum in the small intestine where it can be further broken down and be reabsorbed. And what happens is there's a disruption because this pathway is narrow, things cannot go through, at least not um, as much as how it would normally um, would. So then you have a backing up of things that is within the stomach, okay? So again, this is your narrowing right here in this region, okay? So in a normal stomach, all right, there isn't a narrowing, right? So that way you have your esophagus, you eat your food, it gets digested in the stomach, and then from there, it makes its way down the GI tract. All right, with the stenosis, I don't have that access, okay? That availability is not there, all right? So that is what pyloric stenosis, okay? And the pyloric area is this region, and that's where the stenosis is happening, hence the word pyloric stenosis, okay? So if you do hear that, just try to break down the words in itself, and sometimes you will find the definition within the, the actual medical term, okay? So... Clinical manifestations, right, which is also known as our signs and symptoms, which is our nursing assessment. The main thing that I want you guys to know, I put it in green, I underlined it in green, okay, is projectile vomiting, all right? And when I say projectile vomiting, like to project, right, is the same exact way, but instead it's going to be with vomit. <laughs> so I know that doesn't sound so good, but it's going to be a very forceful thrust, okay that can kind of go up to even three feet okay so you just see the the, the child just start um, uh, vomiting and it's such a, in a forceful way that it can go as far as three feet all right you also have dehydration of course you're going to have your electrolytes imbalances because of the dehydration because again just in anyone who does vomit and you continuously vomit and vomit and vomit you're losing you know stomach acid, uh, you're losing electrolytes within within your body, and of course you're losing fluids. So it ultimately it's going to lead to dehydration. Okay? So I want you, I want you guys to paint that picture in your head when you have this topic of what exactly is taking place. Okay? The stomach cannot travel can't can't have anything traveling through, right? It blocks up here. So if it can't go down, it's gonna come up. So that's why I have that projectile vomiting, and it usually happens after a feeding, okay? So after the child has been fed, you will see that they begin to vomit, okay? You also have metabolic acid alkalosis, all right? Because remember, I'm losing my stomach acid. So if I'm losing acid, what gets a chance to be um, to build up? Alkalosis, right? Alkalosis is my um, bases, right? My things that are not acidic. So I'm going through metabolic alkalosis because I'm losing my stomach acid, all right? Failure to thrive, right? Because if the food is not getting into the stomach and not being able to be absorbed in the small intestine, this child doesn't have a chance to gain the proper nutrients and the proper calorie intake that they need because they're constantly vomiting up everything that they've been um, eating, 
okay? So failure to thrive definitely is gonna go with your malnutrition um, with this with 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 this uh, type of patient, okay? And then you also have your parasitic waves. They are going to be visible from the left side, sorry, left side to the right, across the epigastrium during or um, immediately after a feeding. So you will see the waves on the stomach as, as, as the parasitic waves as it goes by during or after the feeding, okay? So be mindful of that. And also an olive-shaped mass in the epigastrium, pretty much the right upper quadrant, okay? So right of the umbilicus, right? So I'm dealing with my right upper quadrant. So in this area right here is where I'm going to see that olive-shaped mass. Now, the main two things that I highlighted within the signs of symptoms is going to be your projectile vomit and your olive-shaped mass. Those are your dead giveaways in knowing that they're talking about pyloric stenosis. You know how many signs and symptoms are very similar to many different diseases, right? Vomiting can be with anything. Um, you know, uh, fever, uh, uh, signs of infections, or you know, things like that can be seen with so many different uh, diseases. But one that stands out the most with pyloric stenosis is that projectile vomiting and olive shaped mass. Okay, so when you're getting ready to do, do, do your test and they ask you, the patient has an olive shaped mass, automatically think pyloric stenosis. When they said the kid has been experiencing projectile vomiting, automatically think of pyloric stenosis because. 10 times out of 10 times out of 10 times, <laughs> it is going to be the answer, okay? Pyloric stenosis. So now we have our nursing interventions, and with our nursing interventions, you definitely want to monitor strict in, intake and, out, and output, and how you do that, because sometimes it's going to be, you know, infants, because pyloric stenosis does start, you know, within a few weeks of life, so you're probably going to be dealing with your infants, okay? So what you're going to do is you're going to uh, measure the amount of wet diapers and also the fontanelle at the top, you know? If you see it sunken, that lets you know that they're dehydrated, okay? It should not be sunken. It's a little soft spot that the baby has when they're born and it doesn't close up until around 18 months or so. So you definitely want to check to make sure that it's not sunken, okay? Because that, 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 that are signs for dehydration. So that's how you would check on a baby is you know checking the diapers because there's no way to really measure um on an infant okay also uh oh but then you can they have uh these scales that they put for the diapers so i guess that that that's the way that you can uh kind of measure or get an accurate amount you can say that the baby had you know five wet diapers and um when it comes to the stool or so it can be measured so that we can kind of get a pound or so um because sometimes you may have wet diapers but it may be trickles here and there, or um, the poop may be a smear, you know, so you, they definitely have it where you can weigh it, okay? So they do have a scale. Um, also, you want to monitor vomiting episodes and stools, okay, which I just stated here. You will check the stools by the, the scale system that they have. You want to obtain daily weights because, again, within the signs and symptoms, they have failure to thrive, mal uh, mal nutrients is what they're going to have so you want to make sure that they're not losing any weight they're either maintaining and if they gain that's great all right but you definitely want to check daily what are their weight also you want to monitor for signs of dehydration and electrolyte imbalances which i said before you can look at the fontanelles um you can also uh look at the lab work and things like that to check out for the electrolyte imbalances okay now if the child gets to the point where uh, it has to be corrected through surgery. You're going to prepare the child and the and the parents for a pilo, uh, pilomyoectomy, okay, if it is ordered, okay, and I'll get into in a sec what that procedure is, okay. Also, you want to monitor vital signs and you want to check your temperature every four hours. You want to make sure that the patient is NPO before surgery. Okay, and that's, with, and that's standard precaution with any uh, patient who's going to surgery is they're going to be NPO before surgery, okay? IV fluids for fluid imbalances. So if they have um, electrolyte imbalances, you may see them um, be given electrolytes. And if they are dehydrated, you're going to see them get um, normal saline or whatever fluid that the doctor prescribes at that time. But you would definitely see them with fluids if they are uh, dehydrated or have imbalances. 
Also, you want to swaddle them to keep them warm before the surgery to prevent hypothermia. And I remember these infants, they're not able to regulate their own body heat. That's one of the biggest problems that they have. So a lot of times, if you just leave them there, they will lose a lot of that body heat and not able to make their own preserve and keep, keep it. So you definitely want to swaddle them in a blanket or so just to keep them warm before the surgery. Also, conventional feeding will also be slow and gradually increase the increments after uh, eight hours, okay? Next you have, you wanna keep the incision clean and dry, you know? So you definitely don't want the diaper around the incision at all. So um, depending on where the, the incision is, if you have to roll back down on the diaper a little bit, you can go ahead and do so if you have to tape it down a little bit so that way the diaper is not touching the incision because ultimately you don't want poop or, you know, pee or anything once it gets saturated to touch on the wound itself or the incision itself, okay? Also, you want to inspect the site for swelling, for redness, and for any drainage, right? Because drainage is a sign, oh, depending on what type of drainage you see, can be a sign of infection especially if it's yellow, it looks greenish-like, right? And, you know, you also want to check to see if there's any bleeding that's occurring as, as well as um, with the swelling, okay? Also, you want to give pain meds. Remember, these kids are going to be in pain, and they're infants, so you know, they're not able to say, hey, I'm in pain. You may see them cry a lot. You may see cry a lot. You may see that their, um, their vital signs, their blood pressure is high, they're, they're tachycardic, you know, um, more than the norm, because I think uh, for, for heart rates for babies, it's, I think, 110 to 160, okay, or 120 to 160. If you definitely start seeing it in the 180s or so, that lets you know something is not right. Maybe this this baby's in pain, okay, because they're not able to verbalize and say that I am in pain. And also, you want to also take the lungs for adventitious uh, breath sounds, okay, and that, that goes for any surgery. Um, most of the time, you have the risk of having complications of, you know, uh, pneumonia, adventitious, at least in older people, so I can just imagine for uh, little people, <laughs> So Arizona says on Grey's Anatomy, for the little people, um, you definitely want to check their lungs, okay? Make sure that they're breathing okay, that, you know, that you have good breath sounds, it's clear. So that way you can catch early if there is a complication with the lungs. Now we're going to talk about a py pyromyopathy. And pretty much what it is, is it's an incision through the muscle fibers of the pylorus, right? Um, and it may be performed laparoscopically. So pretty much to get more detail, it's pretty much a repair of the pylorus where they cut away those tight muscles that is preventing uh, the passing of the food. So that way now the food is, the stomach is able to empty and the food will be able to pass easily, okay? And that way it's able to be absorbed and things like that. All right, so it loosens those muscles Right after cutting away the tight ones and loosening those muscles, so then now you have what it is, what is a regular functioning GI tract. Okay, so I have an illustration right here to let you know exactly what's taking place with that procedure. So this is the pylorus. Okay, we have our stomach, we have our du duodenum. Okay, which is our small intestine. So within this uh, complication, right, you have all these uh, backing up of the food, so all the green dots is the food, okay, and then this is the stomach acid that it's in, and then this is where the stenosis is taking place, and as you can see, only a little bit of the food can come down, which is why the baby or uh, the infant you'll see will have a uh, presence of stool, but it's still not enough, okay? So what this procedure is going to do, it is going to cut away okay the muscle so then now all right with my green marker so then now the stomach is able to empty and more of the food can pass through and work like a, a regular GI tract, all right? So that's what this surgery is doing, all right? So those of you guys who are my visual learners, that is exactly what is occurring and it's taking place. So with that said, uh, you wanna maintain a patent NG tube and you wanna put it in before the surgery and this is just mainly to decompress the stomach because remember, the stomach was full 
and you know that's why hence they have the projectile vomit. So you want to you know have an NG tube so that way some of that that fluid or uh, uh, secretions and things like that can be um, compressed out of the stomach. So it's going to decompress the stomach because now all the gas and everything that will build up is now going out of the tube into the canister. Okay, so this is going to be replaced in before the surgery. Now, post-operative interventions, I stated some on the, on the last slide, but you're going to, in addition to that, you're going to have uh, your burping uh, frequently. You're going to burp them frequently after they, they have been finished eating, and you're going to handle the infant um, with care after the feeding. So minimal, you know, turning and positioning because, again, you know, they just had the surgery, the stomach is still very sensitive, the GI tract is still very sensitive, so you just want to prevent any any of that, you know, because any vomiting or any forceful thrust, you know, you don't want to open the incision or cause uh, complications to occur, all right? So you want to handle them gently as possible. Also, you want to monitor abdominal distension. You want to see, okay, are they, are, is the stomach function the way it's supposed to? Because, you know, it shouldn't be full anymore. The food should be easily passed through. So you want to check to see if they're, if they have abdominal distension, okay? That tells you a lot about what's going on. Also, you want to monitor for the surgical wound and signs of infection. And again, you want to teach the parents about wound care and feeding, okay? So, you know, this is going to be new to them. They have a newborn, you know, they expect them to, you know, for everything to be okay, and it's not, and it's already hard as it is to be a parent, and it's going to be much harder, you know, to have a child that has a complication that you now have to, to you know, aid to their needs and manipulate certain things that you're so wanting to do as far as holding them up and lifting them up, right? There's certain things that you, you can't do. So you just want to teach them uh, wound care and definitely feedings and how to handle and treat the baby once that has occurred. All right, so that is it. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to leave it in the comment sections below. Also remember to check out my description box for added information. And again, if you have not subscribed yet, what are you waiting for? Go ahead and click that subscribe button. And again, thanks for coming on this journey and see you on the next one.